Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. And we are continuing our study of Operation Husky, the invasion of Sicily that was, was of course, happening 80 years ago uh, right now. Um, if you were with us yesterday, Giulio took us through the Italian defences, the Italian morale, how they put up with their a defence, or, or in some cases didn't put up a defence. Tomorrow, Steve Clay is coming on to talk about the American 1st Division, but today we're talking about the American 3rd Division. Now, Jeff Danby was on previously talking about his absolute specialist subject, which is a 756 Tampa Town, but they were often attached to the 3rd Infantry, Infantry Division, so hence that's why he's coming on to talk about that. A bit of a disclaimer before I bring Jeff in. Unusually, I have been to the pub today. Ronald Gelters, who's been on the show before, talking about the rifle brigade 11th armor division was in town with his family and i had a quick um a quick sherbet in the pub so if i'm a bit slower typing it's because i've had a beer but that's it disclaimer out of the way i'm gonna bring jeff in now G good afternoon jeff how are you today i'm doing great thanks thanks paul um, and we've just been discussing the fact that the more you study something like operation husky you think you know a little about it and then you you scratch below that surface you get deeper and deeper and deeper and the the light at the end of the tunnel in trying to understand World War II just gets further and further away. But in terms of, of your specialist field, the 756th and the 3rd Division, you know, that's what you're going to come and talk to us today. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I always ask people at the beginning of these shows, you know, and as an American, you go around, you go to associations, veterans associations, you've spoken at various places. Is Husky really on people's radar much in the U.S. or is it always Normandy and, you know, the Pacific? I would say in general it is not. I mean, it's it's starting to really fade into uh, into into the into the memory uh, as is the Italian campaign is. Um, I think if you were asked uh, kids today what they know about World War II, they're probably going to talk about Normandy and they're going to talk about the atomic bombs. Uh, it's 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 starting to fade. But uh, among Third Division. Uh, uh, the Sicilian operation and uh, it, Italian campaigns are still very much alive. With anybody that's associated with the Third Division, it's 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 quite a Im, important uh, they important events in uh, Third Division history. So, I mean, and obviously that will come up during the show because as we will learn, and people who don't you know already know this, the Third Division were kind of everywhere, weren't they? They 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 were all the way through the major campaigns, and obviously when yeah. you meet the veterans, they've got a lot of battles they can look back on and talk about with either you know oh my yeah. god that was a terrible one or that one went quite well for us but you yeah. know rating all those different campaigns they were in you know because they 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 travel a lot of a lot of ground in europe um and, and perhaps not maybe not as well known as the as the first division maybe not as well known as some other divisions but you know the the number of medal of honors they received the number of accolades yes. they received they were they were considered by many of the senior commanders a real solid dependable yes. get in there get the job done but yeah um and yeah long service anyway we've got a massive great powerpoint to get through so folks you can join feel free to join in with questions but i promise you there's a lot of information coming your way so as usual the question you're going to ask may be being answered in a couple of minutes time so uh ju just just but, but obviously we love your comments but jeff i'm gonna hand over to you and we look we're gonna talk about the third division in, in husky okay well let's go on to the first slide i always dedicate my uh talks to my grandfather. He was a member of the 3rd Division for a short period of time in southern France. He was a tank uh, platoon leader. He lost his life on the 27th of August. So I always tip my hat to my granddad. Thank you, granddad. So on to the first slide here after that. All right. So we'll, I want to like to do a, a kind of a quick review. Uh, we Last time when we got together, we talked about the Fadala landings. Uh, the 3rd Division landed at Fadala in Operation Torch on the November 9th, uh, 1942. Uh, they had already gone through extensive stateside amphibious training during 41 and 42. I, I believe they were the most experienced U.S. Army Division in amphibious operations. That's why they were sent. Um, amphibious operations at that time and, and late 42 were rather uh, rudimentary. Uh, they used LCVP type or Higgins boat uh, craft. To, they, they loaded them up from troop transports several miles out at sea, these guys clambered down ropes. They used winches to put maybe a light tank or a couple of trucks on one. And that was pretty much the extent of amphibious operations. And it's important to keep in mind because eight months later, you're going to see it's changed quite a bit by the time we get to Operation Husky. So next slide. Um, uh, the landings at Fadala were at night, as they will be at Husky. Uh, seas were rough for them. Uh, uh, the training wasn't that great with the Navy. Uh, that led to some problems. Uh, they lost about half their landing craft during this operation. 
uh, ended up being successful nonetheless. Uh, three days later, they captured Casablanca. That was their objective, uh, fighting French forces that uh, their hearts really weren't in the battle, but uh, it, it ended up being a success. Uh, the third division then remained in uh, North Africa, uh, French Morocco specifically, until about mid-March of 43, while forces continued to build up in North Africa. Uh, their next move was to Arzu in Algeria. That's when they went through some additional training at what was called the uh, Fifth Army Invasion Training Center that was set up in Iran and Ar Arzu. Uh, this is where they uh, upgraded their amphibious tactics and training. The third division was one of the first units to go through that. Uh, next slide. Uh, the third division has a new commander. Um, he takes uh, over command in March of 43. His name is uh, Major General Lucian K. Truscott. He's famous. Uh, Maybe a lot of you know about him already. Um, the former division commander, uh, uh, General a Anderson, he was sent stateside. He was uh, given command of, a, of the 10th Corps. Um, now, um, Truscott's a bit younger. He's a bit more motivated. He's a more aggressive guy. Uh, he was originally born in Texas, but he was raised in Oklahoma. Interesting beginning for this fella. He, he started out as a school teacher uh, before joining the Army in 1917. Uh, he did not come up through West Point. Uh, he was officer candidate school trained. Uh, he was trained in the cavalry branch. You can see the, the cavalry boots he has there. He, once you're a cavalryman, you're, you never give that up. Uh, he was 48 years old at the time, so he's a young, young general. Uh, he had a gravelly voice. Uh, it was the kind of thing that uh, Hollywood would probably love to cast a, a general with. Uh, this was from accidentally drinking carbolic acid when he was a kid. Um, he was a tough trainer. Uh, he had high, expect, high expectations for the men that uh, he commanded. Uh, he had witnessed uh, the combat in Tunisia. He was embarrassed by uh, the American showing there, especially at Kasserine Pass. Uh, that was something he took away. He was not going to let that happen again. Uh, he did not view the Germans as supermen. Uh, he saw that they could be defeated if you outworked them, you outfought them, you outhustled them, and you used sound tactics. Uh, this was so he imparted this on his commanders. Um, next slide. As soon as he took over, he instituted what the men uh, uh, called the Truscott Trot. Uh, this was a march that he wanted the men to uh, cover 30 miles in eight hours. Uh, this would be with full gear. So you're an infantryman, you're carrying around 60 pounds of weaponry and ammunition and supplies. Uh, you were expected to do five miles an hour that first hour four miles an hour the next two, and then the remaining five hours, you're supposed to go three and a half miles to get that 30 miles. Uh, in addition to that, a physical training, uh, they did, it all, as I said, all this extensive amphibious training at third division, about a month there, I believe it was, the plus additional training along the coast later. Uh, there was an uh, emphasis on combined arms training. Uh, he borrowed a lot from uh, what the airborne paratroopers were doing. Uh, he did obstacle courses. He did bayonet training, hand-to-hand -hand combat. Now the guys that couldn't handle it, they couldn't do the trot. They couldn't do the training. They washed out. They went on to other units. And the ones that were left over, uh, not only did they feel that they were survivors, they felt like they were elite. And in a sense, they kind of were. And they had an esprit de corps around that too. Next slide. Um, so uh, after the training, they uh, uh, in Tunisia, I'm sorry, in Morocco and in Iran, they end up going out to Tunisia. Uh, this is where they do some of the last minute training before Operation Husky. Of course, they don't know they're going where they're going, but uh, this is where they kind of did more pillbox stuff, more specific for Sicily. Next slide. Uh, we'll take a quick look here at, uh, at a map of the area and uh, we'll ask ourselves uh, why is Sicily, uh, why was this chosen? Uh, I think you may have covered this in a talk before this, but um, uh, the uh, Allies wanted to make the Mediterranean safe for shipping. Uh, it was susceptible to Axis air attacks. The Luftwaffe was still very much active in the area. Uh, you'll notice it has what's called the Keystone location there in the Mediterranean, right smack dab in the middle. Um, Churchill, uh, believed that Italy was ripe uh, to be knocked out of the war. They were politically weak. Uh, he thought that once uh, we, we put some troops on Italian soil, that might be enough to just get, get them out. Turns out later he was right. Uh, the Russians also had been complaining for a long time that the uh, 
Western allies weren't doing enough to get involved in the war and to, and to uh, confront the Germans if they were paying a, a, a lot in terms of men and equipment. And, uh, and also, uh, this was also to try to get Germany overextended. If they had to fight both the Russians and allies coming up in Italy, uh, they, would have, uh, they would have a lot of trouble keeping divisions on the line. Um, the U.S. Uh, always wanted to just go straight into northern France. Uh, they just, why bother with all this stuff? Um, the British, I think, rightly were said, we're not ready to do that. Uh, it's nice your enthusiasm, but it's not quite time. Uh, Sardinia was also considered. That's on the left side of the map yeah. there. Uh, but it was uh, discounted because it was just outside of air cover uh, from North Africa, from Allied air cover that the Germans were operating air bases out of Sardinia. Uh, they would have done a lot of damage to ships that were trying to land. Now, uh, the, the thing about this, I don't know if you're going to get into this, Paul, with somebody, but uh, the Germans believed the Balkans were the target, uh, Greek, the Greece or uh, the Balkans. Hitler was convinced of it. And the Allies did everything they could to con encourage this with the uh, intelligence and counterintelligence operations. I don't know if you're going to get into that, but Operation Minsk. We, we, we covered it. We covered Minsk Meat with James Holland a bit. And, and, and there's still yeah. some kind of debate as to, you know, that, that Hitler maybe was a bit more focusing on the Balkans, but people like Kesselring, the commanders, yes. were, they were pretty convinced it was going to be Sicily. And, right, and so, right. you know, you have the difference of opinion at different levels. But yeah, no, we have, we've, we, it's come up in passing, yeah. Well, the, the, the point is that the Germans were not prepared in Sicily as, as they would have been had they had they suspected that this was it. So that's important. Uh, next slide, uh, Sicily. We'll just take a quick look at the island. It's about 150 miles across, 100 miles tall. Um, it's very mountainous. Uh, it's for fertile volcanic soil. There's an agrarian economy here. The capital is Pal uh, 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 Palermo at the top. Uh, yeah, it's also a, a a key port city. Um, there's only two miles between uh, uh, over there on the east between uh, Sicily and the mainland of Italy. That's the Straits of Messina. That's important. We'll talk about that coming up. And I will go on to the next slide. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, unit that's near and dear to my heart, the 756 Tank Battalion, uh, at this time they had been working with the 3rd Division for two years. They landed in, in, in torch with them. Uh, they were equipped only with M5 light tanks. They were the state of the art tanks for light tanks, but they were already obsolete as main battle tanks. So next slide, they would be left off the order of battle going into Sicily and uh, they would have to wait in North Africa to join the third division later. And, and it's a big rabbit hole, Jeff, but you know, when, when, when Giulio yes, was talking about the really light Italian vehicles that defending some parts of Sicily, mm -hmm. maybe some, um, some light American tanks actually would have used that terrain quite well because, you know, little villages, little bridges, little, may, maybe there's an argument to say that's, that's an ideal location for these type of tanks. What's your thought on that? Uh, it's possible. I mean, the terrain was not the, the best for tanks in general, but I think they wanted to get uh, medium tanks on the, on, on the on shore in the initial landings and they did they, they did have some tanks from i company of the 66th armored regiment that accompanied the first wave of infantry so uh they they wanted to get some 75 millimeter guns on on shore to sort of match those i mean a 37 millimeter gun isn't going to going to go up against a 75 millimeter gun emplacement the same as a 75 millimeter True. gun on a on an m4 i think that may have been the thought just yeah. guessing no, I mean, again, and we could go down a massive rabbit hole, but yeah. then the, 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 the question is how many 75 millimeter guns were they going to come up against and big caliber guns? And in the end, how many light weapons? Yeah. I mean, it took us through some of the Italian stuff yeah. they were using was, you know, it was pea shooters. It was, you know, so, you know, they, this is all 2020, you know, looking back on this. With right, them, right. But, you know, and the other thing about Sicily that came up with James Hall and others is that it's, it's, we, we've, we've decided, the Allies have decided they want it, but where to land, how to do it, because it's a, it's a it's geographically, it's, it's you know, do you land on the east, do you land on the west, do you land all your forces in one place, do you, come, do you start in different places, converge, that's why, you know, we talked about the Husky plan went through nine different versions until they finally agreed how they're going to do it. Right, right. So I don't think it was a bad decision to leave them off uh, the order of battle. Uh, it, it wasn't trained. Tra uh, terrain amenable to tanks really anyway. I know there were tank battles that took place, but they were going to have a limited role anyway. 
Uh, so yeah, this is just some photos of uh, Truscott talking to the troops before they depart. We'll just go to the next one, same, same sort of thing. Next slide. Uh, we've got the, them loading up uh, and, and, and getting on the LCIs at shore. So here we got the map here. Uh, just a general overview. You've probably covered this already, but for somebody that's not familiar with Operation Husky, uh, uh, U.S. General Dwight D. Eisenhower was the uh, overall commander of the Allied forces in the Mediterranean at the time. Uh, British General Sir Harold Alexander was in command of the 15th Army Group. Uh, these were all uh, ground forces that involved in the operation. Uh, m this would be the 7th Army. Uh, this was newly created under the command of Lieutenant General George S. Patton. Uh, they would land on the left side of Sicily. Uh, they would uh, be a supporting force for the British 8th Army landing over on the right side. Uh, the objective of the Americans was to take uh, uh, Palermo up to the north. Uh, the objectives of the British under the command of uh, Sir uh, uh, Bernard Montgomery, Lieutenant General, uh, very experienced, very similar to Patton, bit, very big ego. Um, there, the uh, British would be attacking up the right side, and their objective was to take Messina. Uh, okay, next. Um, we don't probably need to go too deep into this. Um, you talked about, it, I think, yesterday um, the Axis opposition. There was. Uh, Mostly there were guns, coastal guns in, in forts and ports, uh, not so much along the shore, um, open shore. Uh, they were just starting to put in some emplacements along uh, open beaches. That's because they were more concerned about commando raids and that sort of thing. But the doctrine at the time was that you keep your coastal guns in your forts and ports. That was the likely place an invasion force might come. Uh, there was a 250 thousand armed Italians on paper. Um, they, they did not have the best equipment. They were mostly hand-me-down weapons, the stuff that was captured in France or the Balkans and Greece. They had very little armor. Uh, there was 75,000 Germans there. These were the people you had to be most concerned about. Uh, the, both the 15th and the 29th Panzer Grenadier Divisions were experienced, as was the Hermann Goering Division. Uh, being reconstituted after being banged up in, in uh, North Africa. Uh, the, the big concern was the tanks. They had uh, 46 Mark IVs. Uh, they did have a company of Tigers there, uh, and they did have some uh, Mark Threes, and they had their Sturmgeschutz uh, anti-tank uh, self-propelled guns too. Uh, Luftwaffe is still dangerous at the time. You had to keep that in mind. Uh, and the, the Germans, as we talked about, um, of Hitler especially thought, the Balkans would be the target. Uh, they weren't completely sure uh, that Sicily would be the main zone, so they didn't really beef up their forces here. Next. Okay, so uh, Operation Husky involved uh, 3,000 Allied ships transporting these ground forces. They were roughly about 80,000 men, 7,000 vehicles, 300 tanks, 900 artillery guns, all landing in the first two days. Again, the British are Eighth Army's on the right, Seventh Army on the left. Next, okay. 82nd Airborne paratroopers, they're going to drop in the night before, and they do. Uh, the U.S. Seventh Army was organized a little strange. Uh, they really only had one corps under their command, the Second Corps. Uh, they would be landing on the right near Jela and a little further south. Uh, the 1st Division would attack at Jela along with a, a 9th Infantry Division combat team. Um, the, uh, the 45th, no, I'm sorry, the 1st would land at Jela, and then the 45th and the 9th uh, uh, Infantry Division combat team would land further to the, to the east. Now the 3rd Division, where we're going to focus, uh, they were reinforced. Uh, they were reinforced with the 2nd uh, Armored Division, about half of the division, uh, so they weren't quite a corps in size. Uh, it was still under the command of uh, M uh, Major General Truscott, and they called it Josh Force. Um, the rest of the 2nd Armored Division was held in reserve out on ships, waiting to see where they should land to help shore things up. But it was <clears throat> sort of a, a almost quite a corps in size. So we'll look at here at uh, kind of the breakdown of the 3rd Division in the next slide. So in that uh, left column, we have what uh, basically what the third division was. Uh, normally, uh, the, the three main 
units are, of course, the three re regiments, the 7th, the 15th, and the 30th, <clears throat> plus all the supporting artillery. And then the attached units were a, a, a whole bunch of different artillery units, uh, uh, a third ranger battalion. Uh, there was also some French uh, colonial troops attached. Uh, third chemical mortar battalion. Those were important. Those are the 42, uh, 4 4.2 inch uh, mortars, uh, very effective. But the largest was be uh, basically that brigade size of the uh, Second Armored Division uh, with the 66 Armored Regiment. And that included uh, M4 tanks. Okay. <laughs> a quick question for you, Jeff, because Mark Zelke, when he talked about the Canadian Division a few days ago, was talking about one of the big problems for Husky was. They wanted lots of manpower then, as James Holland said, it, you know, in terms of manpower, it's the, it's the biggest amphibious operation. But there's a real lack of the kind of LCT type vessels to bring ashore trucks. Did the third division have a debate about, you know, which kind of vehicles to, to bring ashore, how much artillery, how much are they going through these kind of same deliberations? The Canadians were. Uh, I don't think so. No, I. I no, I, I don't. I don't. I didn't encounter any of that in, in any of any stuff I've read. Now, I now I have not got my hands on on like the G two or G three right. reports. Okay, so I can't. I can't say that completely. So I'm relying on the unit histories. Uh, so this is one area where I did not get into G two or G three reports because the 756 wasn't wasn't involved. So, but uh, I haven't run across that. Um, no, I, I know that they started using these ducks. Uh, the the uh, th those were new. Uh, we'll see photos of those later. <clears throat> but no, I, it was very artillery heavy. I know they were using the uh, the, the M7 priests. Uh, those were fully tracked, 105 millimeters. Uh, no, I didn't run across that. Okay, so I mean, we had, I think you just answered the question because Trent Delenko asked us. The Fifth Armored Field Artillery Group, SP guns or field artillery observations. So is that that's priests, is it? Which one? Fifth Armored Field Artillery. Is um, that? I think so. Yeah, because that's part of the armored division. Uh, yeah, they would have been they would have been fully tracked. I don't think those were towed. Okay, thanks. So moving on, maps. We love maps. I think. I think. Please don't quote me. Okay, yeah, next is uh, we're going to take a quick look, just a quick look at the beachhead. The 3rd Division Joss Force was landing at Lakata. Um, they would be landing in four places. We'll get into details later. Their main, mainly their job to clear the beaches, take the port of Lakata. There was an airfield nearby that was either incomplete or not operational. Uh, there was uh, um, the uh, airfield troops that were also part of this force that would land and help get that field prepared. Their job was to achieve the yellow line and establish the beachhead that first day. You can see that dotted line there. And move on to the next. Just some photos yeah. here of Lakata. There's about 30,000 civilians that live here. It's flat ground near the beach, but it gets hilly real quickly behind it. Uh, areas defended by about several thousand Italian soldiers. Again, not the best equipped. Uh, they're mostly they're concerned about these coastal guns. Uh, they had 105 millimeters, 76 millimeters, 75 millimeters, even a 47 millimeter millimeter gun could do damage to a, a wooden, uh, you know, craft, uh, wooden boats landing. So yeah. they were concerned mostly about these. On the next one, just another quick photo of, of the terrain. You could, this is a view toward Jela. Jela is 16 miles away. You can just about make it out there on the coast, just to give you an idea. Lakata is in the foreground. We're going to take a look back in the next slide and see Lakata from the other direction. Just an idea, it's kind of a hilly little area. All right, so now we're gonna head in. We're on our way. Um, when they departed from, from Africa, they, they took a number of different routes. There were different convoys going off in different directions. This was again to fool German observation. Uh, some took off a few days earlier, went in the direction of Greece, some went in the direction of Sardinia, but they all came back together about a day before and they rendezvoused off, off of Malta and it just so happened that they got themselves into this gale they didn't expect. And it was pretty rough. Seas were pretty bad. Uh, seasickness was just horrible aboard these ships. Um, they weren't sure for a little while, for a few hours there, if, if this was going to throw the timetable off or what they were going to do. But when they once they got within 90 miles of Sicily, uh, seas suddenly leveled off and everything seemed to clear up for them. 
Uh, but this was this this gave them some uh, gave them a scare. I mean, you don't want to send guys ashore that don't have food on their stomachs and they're dehydrated or you feel like crap. Uh, so uh, fortunately, and then but but maybe it had a, a, an actually reverse effect because the guys were anxious to get off the ships. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything's well, gonna be better than this. Yeah, yeah. Welcome going ashore. If, if there was machine gun fire, there's that's okay. Um, so all landings were able to, to proceed on time. Um, and we'll, we'll, so we'll get in a little closer here. We'll go and see exactly where they landed. Attack landed uh, or uh, began at two in the morning. Again, a night attack, uh, naval bombardment for about 30 minutes uh, to soften up targets. This bombardment went up and down the coast. So it was to con kind of confuse the defenders that didn't know where the landings were going to be. Um, then they uh, sent the, the boats out at 3.40 in the morning. Uh, a good sign. Uh, they returned soon after. They, they didn't have a whole bunch of them that ended up getting stuck somewhere. So that was a good sign. Um, again, second amphibious landing for the 3rd Division under fire. Uh, these uh, four regimental combat teams uh, landed on both sides. Uh, Lakata, two on one side, two on the other. They all landed pretty much on time at uh, 4 in the morning. Now, a regimental combat team, uh, for a viewer, just to, just to rehash it, <clears throat> that includes infantry, engineers, artillery, and aircraft. It includes in, in a platoon of M4 tanks. We're also accompanying these guys. So it was like a little mini division, and they would be able to fight for a couple days or three days without having to be supplied. That was the idea. Uh, they did achieve complete tactical surprise. Uh, the, the Italians weren't really weren't expecting anything. I don't know if they thought it was a ruse or something. Um, that lay, at Red Beach, uh, this would be on the far left. Uh, this was about six miles west of Lakata. Uh, the lands were pretty much unopposed. Uh, once they got in a little bit, started to get to the bluffs, they did encounter some machine gun fire and, and artillery fire. Um, there was one uh, 47 millimeter Italian gun that gave them some trouble. It did delay the, the, the next wave of landings, that, but the Navy was able to silence that gun. Uh, communication between the infantry and Navy was much better during this operation, I should say. Uh, and all objectives for uh, Red Beach were achieved by 10 in the morning, so it was rel relatively quick. Uh, at Green Beach, uh, this is where the attached 3rd uh, Ranger Battalion and the 2nd Battalion of the 15th Regiment landed. Same time, 4 in the morning. They were a little bit piecemeal and they, when they arrived, um, but they were able to get everything organized by five in the morning. Uh, there was barbed wire that they had to destroy with these Bangalore torpedoes. If you're not familiar with those, those were long tubes filled with explosives they set off to cut the wire. Uh, they got through that pretty well, okay. There was only two machine guns they encountered. Uh, nobody fired at them from them. That, you know, don't know why, if they were occupied or not. Uh, they cleared the beach in two hours, it was mostly an engineering job, and they went and they took the town by 1130 that morning. So there, uh, here, just a quick picture here of Lakata. And just, do we know how much these, you know, the, the, the first wave troops, how much they had been through sand tables and maps and photo recon? Because, well, you know, the further you get into the war and overlord and the same in the Pacific, it seems to me the more information was given to the to the, to the invading troops because we have better aerial reconnaissance, we have better intelligence. So are these guys going in with a full understanding of the terrain on the beach and off the beach? Or what's your what's your what's your, your take on that? Okay. Yeah. Again, I, I haven't seen the G3 and uh, G2 reports. The G2 reports would probably have that. Um, I would imagine they did. Um, I'm sure that that uh, probably Bizerte Harbor, the officers were brought in before the operation, 24 hours before the operation, big sand table, some building somewhere, double security, all that stuff. And, and, and they went through it. And, uh, and, and they, I'm sure they had a pretty good handle of, of the situation. Yes, I, I can't imagine that they, they wouldn't. But I mean, it, in, in in basic terms, it can't have been as much as Overlord later on because of oh, the no. with which Husky was put together. I mean, I see that. We, no, we probably not. Earlier. No, they're uh, probably relying on aerial photos. Uh, I don't know. I I couldn't tell you, but I don't have any indication to believe that they had a whole lot of uh, spies on the ground, that sort of thing, like they did, say, in southern France, where they had excellent preparation, or Normandy, where they had excellent preparation. They had... Yeah. Uh, French resistance and OSS uh, operating back there. I don't know if that situation was the same as Sicily. So you're probably right. It was probably a little more hazy. 
that were relying on on uh, maps and probably reconnaissance photos and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But yes, I think they were probably well prepared going in there because it, it unfolded well. Um, you know, I don't think they they were caught unaware. We got the next one. There was a little bit more resistance on this side of, of the beach, by the way. So at Yellow Beach here, when we're getting more toward the eastern side of Lakata, we had the 1st and 3rd Battalion of the 15th land here. The riders were a little rough. They still landed on time. Uh, they were given orders to destroy pretty much everything. There was more pillbox installations and, and gun installations here. And anything that looked uh, suspicious, they were told, just, just destroy it. Um, <clears throat> according to the Unit histories, they caught the Italians sleeping in their pillboxes. I don't I don't think they were necessarily really sleeping. They could have been, but I think the Italians just weren't expecting a force of that size to ar arrive. Maybe they were expecting commando raid or something. I don't know. But it did it went well for them right, right off the bat. The, there were some machine guns they had to take out that were in pits. They weren't very well protected. Across the road, there were some in pillboxes that they destroyed those quite quite readily. Uh, they did encounter more small arms fire here. They had to be a little more careful. I mean, they did lose people, and you know, I don't get me wrong. Um, uh, there were also two artillery guns uh, that challenged them. They had to take out. Uh, they did secure the beach itself in, in just uh, like two hours, and they did capture their first German prisoner here. I don't know who he was. I don't know what unit he's from. I'd imagine he was an advisor of some sort, but uh, the unit history does say they did capture the first German prisoner here. And then they also moved into Lakata around the same time. Uh, so here, yeah, here's a picture of the beach to give the viewers, viewers a sense of, of what they were up against. Uh, of course, it's morning, a little clearer. Now we'll go way over to the blue beach here. We'll, we'll go into this a little bit more detail. Um, uh, the second battalion of the 30th landed here. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Lyle Bernard was in command of, the, of this uh, battalion, and we're going to learn a lot about him later. He's he's one of the heroes of the 3rd Division in Sicily. Uh, their job was not only to take the beach, but they had to establish contact with the 1st first Division land in the jail. That was 16 miles away, so they had kind of a double duty here. It was important for them to close that gap, right? That's a lot of beach to close. Um there was, uh, of course, the barbed wire, the machine gun pill boxes that they had to take. Uh, they had used, uh, they had rehearsed with these 10 man anti pill box teams. Uh, these guys were uh, trained to do this. They had practiced this in North Africa. They used bazookas, rifle grenades, et cetera, to flank and take these things out. They had naval gun support that was very well, very effective here. Uh, they cleared the beach again by about seven in the morning. Then they pushed inland. That's the next one. Uh, they did have M4 tank support, again, from a, a platoon of tanks from I Company of the 66th Armored Regiment. Um, they had crossed the highway. Uh, they had to knock out 175 millimeter gun. They took 100 prisoners, knock out a second one. They had to take about 100 more. Uh, then they had to knock out a third one. And uh, But by the end of the day, before night, uh, they had taken over 500 prisoners. So they had a little bit more of a cleanup job on that, that area of the beach. But it's important to do this because uh, this is supposed to be the area of making contact with the first uh, division over on, on Jela. So spent a little time on that one. But here we can get a picture in the next one of, of what they were, the terrain they had to cover. You can see some of the, now these are some of these aerial photos or photos that were taken. Um, I don't, I don't know for sure, but I'd imagine this is the kind of stuff the officers were able to look at before they went. This was the photos that were taken. Okay, so to, maybe to answer the question from several slides ago, yep. they, they had opportunity to sort of review this stuff, what to expect. Sure. I got a dog story. Yeah, I knew that was coming. All all the, right. I, I should call up all the people who love dog stories. Okay, Here we go. So. What, a, what a legend Chips is. <laughs> Chips, the, Chips the wonder dog. Um I company of the 30th uh, Infantry Regiment had a German Shepherd uh, that was a trained sentry dog. Uh, it, it ended up being sort of a mascot too. Uh, uh, he had been with them since they, when they first landed at Fagala. Had been with the outfit for you know eight months since. Uh, when they came under machine gun fire while landing at Blue Beach, uh, he broke away from his handler and he uh, rushed that machine gun hut and he attacked the two man crew inside. And he forced these two Italians to surrender. Uh, and uh, uh, General Truscott learned of this and said, well, this 
this dog needs a silver star. That's uh, the silver star material. So Warden Silver Star, uh, the U.S. War Department didn't, didn't think that was a, a great idea. We're not going to award uh, uh, medals to dogs and mules and that sort of thing. So uh, Chips, the Wonder Dog, uh, his star was taken away from him. But he's, he is a legend in uh, third division history. So and we'll we'll, yeah. Yeah, we got our meals here. Just some, just we'll, we'll zip through these a little quick. This is just to, to show the viewers. Uh, the photos were hard for me to get. Um, I did not go to the National Archives specifically for Sicily, so I don't have a, a ready batch of them. So I had to borrow secondhand ones and things. So there, there are, this, uh, you know, I found there are just not very many. I mean, U.S. infantry photos in Sicily at all. I mean, the Canadians, it, Melissa Wing, who we had to postpone her show, she's, she's going to come back and do it. Yeah. The Canadians for, for Sicily have got their press sorted out they've got great photographers there great footage but the americans there's a real lack of uh, i mean they probably exist somewhere but there's a real a real lack of them online and in books well they don't i thought maybe Mar i have i have a number of copies from mark clark's photo albums fifth yeah. army and i was hoping maybe he his stuff would have it i have copies of that and no he didn't have anything in sicily's nothing at all in his album so unfortunately i i wasn't able to find anything better but this will give the view, the viewers at least some idea of what they were doing. This is the jetty there at Lakata. Uh, there was a, a, a some railgun emplacements there. The Navy knocked out very effectively. We've got a half track coming off uh, one of these LCTs here. This stuff was not available eight months earlier at Operation Torch. This could this would carry about five vehicles, five tanks. Um, we've got the moving inland here on the next one. Uh, but but here here's the next photo. We've got one of these LCIs on the beach. Uh, this could carry this. Could, I, I don't I think it was a battalion of infantry that they could carry um, 800 men. And you could see there was a, a, a gangway they could drop. These guys drop off in about one or two feet of water very easily get them ashore. Uh, this was another effective way of getting men and, sh and sh stuff ashore. We've got LCTs, LSTs here. Next frame, same thing, LSTs unloading, about 16, 17 tanks and vehicles off those. None of this stuff was available for Operation Torch. This is all new. So uh, you can see how far the Allies have advanced. They even have these ducks, uh, these amphibious trucks uh, that will become very effective. They, they end up being sort of iconic, like the Jeep, you know, yeah. the duck. And yet, if you look in the rear of these photos, a distinct lack of support vessels within sight of these photos. I mean, everything you see overlord, the sea, it's a cliche, but the sea is always just full of ships as far as the eye can see. Yeah. This is this is much sparser. They're, they're, you, know, you can understand the Allies are still building. They're not at their peak yet. There's still a lot, another year of production to go before they can even consider mounting a proper second front. You can see that, as you said there, they've learned, they've learned from Torch, things are progressing, but yes. they're, still, they're still nowhere near the size of force they were a year later. You know, now that you mentioned that, you know what's missing from these photos too? The blimps. Yeah, yeah, I exactly. See, yeah, I haven't yeah. seen any of the blimps, to, and aircraft blimps, so uh, that's true. So it's a work in progress, right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, at the end of the day, uh, the third division did succeed in uh, establishing the beachhead. They took uh, three thousand prisoners the first day. Uh, their beachhead actually ex expanded uh, beyond the yellow line. They were about eight miles deep, fifteen miles wide. <clears throat> now their main objective is still one hundred twenty miles away. That's uh, Palermo, <clears throat> but a very successful day. <clears throat> I had this comment from Murdio Lou eighty one is saying. Actually, the U.S. Navy initially refused to ship the mules. Captains were reluctant to carry them, afraid of the foul, uh, foul and mess in underdecks they would make. But Truscott insisted. So there's a little bit of extra detail there about, about Truscott. And, and he'd also said earlier that Truscott had recognized that Sicily is good terrain for the use of mules. You're not going to be rely on, be able to rely on vehicles. So, yeah. so as some people said, Truscott is... I think I think proper military historians are aware of how good he is. I don't know that the average person uh, is no. aware of Truscott. You know, you ask the man in the street, the woman in the street, they're going to say Patton, they're going to say MacArthur, Mark Clark. But I don't think Truscott is in 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 everybody, but he should be. I mean, for my money, he's up in the top five in, clearly. Yeah, he was a complete package. Uh, there, yeah. there was there was I, I there was no weakness in the guy that I see. He was he yeah. was a complete package. Yeah. Um, so the D-Day plus two or the second day, um, 
Uh, the Italians did try to mount a counterattack on the third division. It, it didn't succeed very well. They did, they did bring these um, anti tank guns in to play the 90, these 90 millimeters. Uh, this was captured by the 15th Infantry Regiment. This is one of the 15th Infantry Regiment captured near uh, Campobello. Uh, it didn't secede. Um, there were the, the Germans were uh, involved in force here finally too. So the first real German opposition, the 15th uh, Infantry Regiment, a third division encounters was here. They captured Campobello that afternoon. Um, so, the, you know, there was some, some attempt to try to thwart them, but it, it really didn't succeed. Uh, at the same time, further to the to the west, the, uh, the next slide, yeah, the seventh is moving inland. Uh, they capture the town of Palma uh, di Montesciaro. Uh, now they're 12 miles northwest of Licata. Uh, again, it's characterized by some brisk, uh, just sh quick, sh sharp fights. Uh, they 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 kill about 60 Italians. They capture 200 more. Uh, it's really not a match. Uh, the enemy understands this. They re retreat to Agrigento, further to the northwest. Uh, the Third Division's progress is excellent compared to what is happening with other Allied units in other areas. So uh, Italian resistance in this area, what they expected to get from the Italians just wasn't showing up. Uh, so uh, the Third Division was having much more success than they expected. Uh, and as a result, uh, General Alexander actually had the Third Division halt for a few hours because he didn't want them getting too far ahead of everybody else. Next slide. All right, so on the 13th of July, Trust gets itching to keep things going. He asks Patton, hey, can we continue? Uh, Patton goes to Alexander. Uh, he gets Alexander's permission to continue, uh, but uh, they, they're going to call this a reconnaissance in force. Uh, it, it isn't going to be really, a, they're not going really unless they're looking for a fight. So Patton comes back and says, okay, yes, uh, General Truscott, you can go ahead, uh, but don't get into any fight that you can't back out of. Uh, that's, a, that's a direct quote. Uh, Truscott, so Truscott says, okay. And so he sends his entire 7th Infantry Regiment out on a reconnaissance force. So basically assuring that it's, it's, it's going to be a fight he's going to be able to win. And it, it ends up succeeding. Uh, the next three days, uh, they go, they flank Agrigento. Uh, they pretty much take the town rather quickly. They take 6,000 more prisoners. A third battalion then uh, goes down to the the port, uh, port uh, Empedeclo captures that as well. Uh, and it's by this time in a strategic setting, the German uh, field commanders in Sicily realize that, that this is a lost cause. Uh, and so they shift their, their uh, emphasis away from trying to break the beachhead uh, into uh, of trying to set up these uh, series of uh, withdrawals, um, fighting withdrawals. So let's take a let's take a quick look at the map here. Um, um, Patton uh, then goes to General Alexander and uh, he asks if he can uh, unleash the Third Division, uh, 82nd Airborne, Second Armored, uh, north to Palermo. Their objective. Uh, Alexander is a little skeptical of of the American American abilities, uh, rightly so, after what he's seen in North Africa. Um, he decides, yeah, go ahead. Let's see what you can do. Show us what you can do. Um, they dissolve Josh, Josh force. Uh, now with, uh, with three units like this, three divisions, you've got to have some kind of provisional corps established. So a provisional corps is set up under the command of uh, Major General Jeffrey Keyes. Uh, and Truscott tells his third division troops, okay, I want you in Palermo in uh, five days. Uh, it's still a hundred miles away. So all that training in North Africa, next slide. It's time to employ the Truscott trot. Uh, so you got to now you got to understand this is hot, dusty weather. Water's kind of scarce. Uh, you know this this was a this was a big this was a big athletic thing, right? I, I think people need to appreciate that. Um, they're also they're, they've got to deal with uh, still some skirmishing. There's minefields. There's booby traps to deal with. Engineers got to come forward to clear this stuff. Uh, anything that these Italians or Germans try to put in their way, though, forces. Or doesn't doesn't stop them. Uh, so on the 19th and 20th July, the third division marches 54 miles in just 33 hours, uh, which was at the time an all-time record for infantry marching. I don't know if that still stands, but 
Uh, they were going back and looking at uh, a civil U.S. A civil war tri uh, marches and so forth. And this was the best any any American army had ever done. So that was a kind of bragging rights, third division bragging rights. But also uh, it tells you how important it is to have uh, well-trained troops and athletic troops, correct? Yeah. 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 So now, now they're at a point where they're actually halfway between Lakata and Palermo. Now I'd imagine maybe Alexander might have raised an eyebrow at that uh, and saying, okay, well, maybe these Americans, maybe I can trust them a little bit now. Uh, so about halfway through, uh, they've got to attack this town of San Stefano, uh, Keys, Kina. If I, you know, anybody Italian out there, please, please forgive me. I'm an English speaker and I'm not even a good English speaker. So my Italian's really bad. Uh, but on the morning of the 20th, they uh, take the town. It falls that afternoon. Another 750 prisoners taken. This is pretty much how the march to Palermo went. The next day, uh, where are we? Next day. Yeah. Yep, Cor yep. yeah. Next day, uh, the 7th Infantry Regiment, 15 miles northwest of San Stefano, they take the town of Corleone. Another 500 Italians taken, skirmish fighting. Uh, they're now only 20 miles away from Palermo. And uh, we'll, we'll take a quick look at the big map here. Uh, this is a kind of a view of, of the Provisional Corps. Uh, if you look on the left side of the map, you'll see the 3rd Division pretty much going straight up to Palermo. You've got the 2nd Armored kind of cleaning up things more to the west, protecting that flank, making sure that nobody's going to come in and threaten the 3rd Division from that direction. And you got the 82nd Airborne cleaning up things all the way over to the western, western uh, side there. All right. Um, and no, no, just let's pause on that map there. This is where I think Husky is really interesting in many ways because you've got differing fortunes from the different landing sites. You know, a week or a week or so in, you know, when, again, I'm a Normandy guy. A week in from Normandy, most beachheads are about the same. You know, in broadly speaking, the distance inland from Utah, Omaha, there it's about the same. But in Husky, you've got some units that have been counterattacked. You've got some units that are going, the Canadians up against the really tough, let's say, of German, and, yet the, and the British are getting stuck up near Catania and Primo. So there's a really differing fortune, fortunes. I mean, when, when Steve comes on tomorrow and talks about the first division, they're going through the landings, broadly speaking, very similar to the third division. But yet within a few days, things deviate very quickly, don't they? Yes. Yeah. Well, they got, they, they, they were counterattacked by, uh, by, uh, Herman Gearing, Jim. Herman Gearing. Yeah, so so that that's where I think to study it. If you if you you know if if people are watching this and they particularly focus on the third division or the eighty second airborne or yeah. the British Corps, you can you or the Canadians, you know, you can get a very different picture of the Sicily campaign depending on which unit you kind of yeah. focus on. So you, as as good as that is, you kind of need to look at the whole picture as well because there are these very different things happening across the island that I think are. That if, if you focus on one unit, you kind of lose sight of a bit. Well, this is where maybe some credit needs to be given to uh, uh, Sir, uh, General Alexander, uh, recognizing uh, on the ground where the opportunities were. So uh, Patton said, there's an opportunity here. Maybe he was skeptical of it, but say, oh, let's see what you can do. And away they go. So he recognized that there was that opportunity. They took advantage of it, correct? Yeah, no, definitely. No, it's fascinating stuff. And by the way, the sidebar, we're just saying how, how fantastic this, this is and how great you are. So uh, I'm loving it. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so Palermo uh, falls on the 22nd of July. Uh, the third division closed in three columns on the town, a city, I'm sorry, the capital city. Uh, the Italian general in command of of uh, of the forces there, uh, Giuseppe uh, Molinero, uh, surrendered unconditionally to Major General Keyes. That was a good move. OK, uh, he was overmatched. It was just going to be, you know, bloodshed that was unnecessary for civilians and everything else. Uh, but in the process, thousands of Italians and German prisoners were taken Um this allowed the third division a chance to finally catch their breath after 13 days of, of, well, you know, not real difficult fighting, but a, a lot of, of, of athletic uh, uh, requirements. Correct. And, and not giving that, the, you know, the, as you said, there's not a massive amount of enemy in front of them, but if you're moving at that pace, you're not giving the enemy breathing room at all. They're not getting any chance to, to think about prepared positions and falling back. If you keep the pressure up, which was something I think Truscott is known for. You know, you, you keep the enemy 
having to react yeah. to you rather than giving any time to because Kesselring, as we know later in Italy, we're going in a massive rabbit hole, is the master of pulling her back a bit, putting a line, pulling yes. back a bit, and just yes. Yes. making yes. the allies pay yes. for every bloody yard they exactly. take. Here in Sicily, yeah. if you keep the pressure up, you don't let the enemy chance to uh, to, 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 to do anything. Yeah, and, and, and I can't, you know, you, you don't want to say it was easy because if you're the guy on point, <laughs> you're, you're the one that's got to be out in front. If you're the unit that's out in front, you don't know what you're up against. You're out, you're operating in the blind. You're going up, you're going around the bend, you're going up around this mountain, you're going, you know what you're running into. And now you're finally, you're in a, in a fight. You don't know how much, you know, so it, it I want to say it's easy. Okay. It just, as it kept them on their heels, fortunately kept them on the heels. They weren't able to establish any kind of meaningful defense. Yeah. Uh, so that, that, that I think goes to, to the training, uh, trust gets yeah. training. Okay. Yeah, definitely. All right. So, oh, but I want to say that uh, the third division is able to rest. Uh, the, the harbor was was uh, was secure. The harbor will be important later. The Allies they had to clean it up. There was a number of ships that were sunk there. The Allies had sunk, but that harbor ends up becoming important later. Uh, these are just some photos of of the liberation of Palermo. We can just just uh, kind of cruise through those. Now, let's take a quick overview of what's happening at this time. So, we had the third division that moved in. Uh, we also have uh, the, the 45th Division is coming up from the middle, from the Second Corps area, and they uh, cut to the coastline and they start moving in toward Messina, but they're but they're beat up, they're banged up, they got a rest. So the Third Division is called forward after a few days of resting at, at Palermo to take over. So the Third Division is now going to take on this uh, third and final phase of this operation. And that will be the march along that coast to Messina. Uh, and that begins on pretty much on August 1st, okay? And this is where these Germans will set up those defensive lines, yeah. although they're not fully set like they would be little, little later in Italy, but they start setting up some of these defensive lines that you talked about Kesselring was so good at doing. Yeah. All right. So the first thing, the, 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 the 3rd Division, uh, they, they, uh, they start to – the fight it's uh san stefano di camastra this is about 90 miles away from messina the objective uh the first battalion of 30s is the first to to the truck here they did not have to march fortunately trucks were employed uh the weather though has gotten much hotter or somewhat more it's 100 to 110 uh, about midday uh fahrenheit that is uh it's it, you know the guy said it was like fighting in a blast furnace uh, it's humid, right? Water is hard to find, uh, very hard to find. These guys are going around trying to fill canteens, canteens that they've, you know, four or five canteens they've lifted from Germans or Italians are trying to fill them up at, at water trickling down off the mountains. And of course, the Germans uh, start booby trapping these areas. Uh, so uh, there's a single lane of road uh, that's going through between uh, Palermo and Messina, uh, right along the coast. Uh, the Germans uh, just do everything they can to make it held. Uh, they mine it, they crater it, they uh, they blow up bridges along the way. So the real unsung heroes for the Third Division and the Sicilian campaign were the Tenth Engineer Battalion. Right. Uh, they these guys pretty much worked round the clock, nonstop, without sleep. And a little later, you're going to see something they did that was quite amazing. On August second, they were able to cover 19 miles. Uh, there was little resistance at first. Uh, they they start heading to some tougher resistance at this town of Coronia. They do capture the town, but the fighting is a little tougher. Uh, Truscott was there to witness it. Uh, one of his uh, uh, regimental exos was seriously wounded by a mine, uh, run over a, with a jeep. Um, uh, Coronia does fall, uh, and they move on eight miles uh, further east to San Fratello. This will be a, a much bigger battle. Uh, the Germans now have put in more teller mines and booby traps along the way. The Germans are able to set something up more substantial. And you're going to see here, uh, this might look familiar to anybody that's looked at Italy and the battles of Italy. Uh, what do you see here? You see mountainous terrain. You see a river. You see a valley. And you see a mountain on the left that the Germans are holding. And you got to cross that river. And you got to come up that terrain in full view of them and somehow dislodge them from the mountain. This is going to look familiar over and over and over in Italy, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so, so here's another view of that mountain. Uh, 
that, you know, you can see you don't have a whole lot of places you can hide, right? And you got to use mules to, to truck in supplies. Next frame, same thing. This, the next frame here would be the German view. So you've got, you can see everything, right? Everything coming in, the river down there. So mules had to be employed, um, to bring in supplies. And so for the, for, for like four days, uh, we've got a battle. Um, Again, Germans on that high ground. We go next frame here. Yeah. Yeah, so you've got this uh, bottleneck, Germans on high ground. A trust cut tries uh, ordering some attacks. Uh, they don't succeed. Uh, he Then he orders some aggressive patrols on the night of the 4th and 5th of August to try to figure out exactly where the Germans are and what their strength is as much as best as possible. He orders an all-out attack by two of his regiments with the seventh ready to exploit a breakthrough. So it's a full court press here. Um, the, uh, the fighting was vicious. Uh, it, it goes on for several hours, but the attack successful. The Germans are finally forced off the mountain uh, that night. Uh, the town itself falls the next morning. Uh, 500 prisoners are taken. Uh, the third battalion of the 15th uh, was especially hit hard in this. Uh, they had to hold ground. Uh, under a time on target artillery barrage and uh, several counterattacks, the Germans were really focusing on their area. They held it. And as a result, they were later awarded the Presidential Distinguished Unit Citation. Um, again, here's a view of that terrain. Uh, just, just a quick one on the next slide. And we'll go here. And, uh, well, yeah. We just got a couple of questions, Jeff, about... about yeah. Uh, does Truscott leave from the front? And I think the answer is pretty much yes. And how does yes. he get on with Patton? And and is it in any way uh, the conflicts causing any problems to the to the to the to the campaign? No, I I haven't run across any kind of any kind of conflicts with Patton. I think there are men very like minded, very like minded men. They're, they're they're different, but they've got they've got the same kind of goal in mind. Haven't they? And I think there's uh, definitely a mutual respect, isn't there? Yes, uh, they're both fighting generals. Uh, Patton might have been more ostentatious, certainly, you know, the pearl handle revolvers and all that. But but they're, but um, but they're both cavalrymen, right? Uh, they both like yeah. to strike hard and fast. Um, so I, I think they're they're very they're very like minded. There's a lot. Truscott had a lot of respect for Patton. Okay, uh, so I don't I don't think there was really any conflicts. If, if there were, I haven't run across them, or they kept them private. So I'm not an expert on either man. Uh, so maybe a biographer might might have some insight on that. Um, OK, um, one of the things Truscott did again, I told you he was a brilliant general, a fighting general. Uh, he, he he had a sort of an ace up his sleeve uh, when he ordered this all out attack. He was he pulled back one of his battalions. This would happen to be Lieutenant Colonel Bernard's battalion, the second battalion of the 30th. And he had them do an amphibious end around. Uh, uh, they would land seven miles behind German lines. Uh, this was about three miles east of, of St. Agata. Uh, this attack was supposed to happen the same night the all-out attack took place, but it got delayed. Uh, as I said, the Luftwaffe was still active. The Luftwaffe managed to, to hit them uh, while they were uh, well staging. Uh, damaged an LST, so it, it delayed it about 24 hours. The attack still continued, so it, it took place the next night. Uh, Bernard's battalion landed virtually unopposed uh, at 3 a.m. on the 8th. Uh, they successfully cut off that highway. Uh, and then the next slide here, you can see they, uh, they killed about 250 uh, enemy. They captured another 100. Uh, they destroyed uh, four tanks. They destroyed about uh, 14 trucks. And then about eight hours later, the 7th Infantry pushing through that gap uh, made contact with them the next day. And uh, this completely flushed the Germans and Italians out of that area. So this defensive position did not hold because of not, not only that, that aggressive all-out attack, uh, but also this, this little end around, I think, might have unnerved them. Uh, it came a little late. Um, it should have happened the night before. It might, might have been much more spectacular. Uh, so it was a little late, but it ended up planting the seed in the, in the idea. A patent loved this idea, so he wanted them to do it again, and they did do it again. We'll get into that next. Um, 
Here's just a, a quick a slide. Uh, this is the Battle of San Fratello, just to show kind of the units and how it worked. I'm not, we already covered it, so we'll just get yeah. through it. But if somebody wants to stop and pause, they can see it. Uh, we got Italians that were captured here. Um, you know, uh, they don't look very happy. Why would you? Yeah, but, that, but that's the coastal guys again, isn't it? That's, that's yeah, the, they're yeah. not, they're not really, they're not, no, no, they're not. Uh, I, I don't want to say none of them, they're not good fighters or anything like that, but why? Why would you want to fight it? It's just, it's over. Why, why do you want to fight yeah, for these? No, definitely. You know, um, we had a good, good question from Ian Carr. Had the third infantry division acquired local guides they trusted? Um, yes. Um, I, I did read of instances of that. Yes, they did. Um, uh, I think there was a case of an Italian doctor that, that aided them. Um, yes, they did. I, I don't think it was maybe as extensive as it's going to be later in France, but uh, yes, yes, they did. Okay, thank you. Um, are we moving on, or is it? I forget. What yeah, we're, we're moving on. on. We can just zip through these yep, slides yep. here. This is Saint Agata falling. You know, you can see the damage here. Uh, you can see the, you know, the civilians. I, I always, I always feel terrible for civilians in, in these situations. You, you can never forget the uh, the cost that that the locals pay in this kind of stuff. You know, it's fun to talk about tactics and armies and all this, but it's civilians that really pay the cost. You can see these homeless. Civilians on the street here. We've got a, a, a wounded uh, a soldier here. Uh, that is an American medic. Uh, that is a third division. You can see the patch on the shoulder. You can see how destitute the Sicilians were too. Uh, Americans uh, kind of felt for them, you know. Americans were famous for giving like uh, chewing gum and candy and stuff. Uh, and, and of course, uh, they had a reputation for being sort of generous with that. But, the, but, um, you know, there's a lot of Americans that had Italian descent, right? And uh, yeah. so you, you asked earlier about guides. Well, you you already had Americans that could speak Italian. So there would be Americans that could make contact with locals and that sort of thing. So well, uh, just, a, just a point of interest, that photo on the right there of the medic, that's one of the few absolutely definite 3rd Infantry Division photos in high resolution that I could find of the system. I know. It's like I there's so few of them. It's, it's pathetic. I know. They got to be somewhere. I'll look for them. Yeah, next time. And um, we've got some various questions about the mafia coming up because James Holland pointed out the fact that the the mafia had lucky looking at Luciano in New York had been making contact. There was, but it does depend on where you are in Sicily because the, the basically the, the, the further north is more mafia. The hillside stuff, the coastal area down the south is yeah. less mafia. But they were definitely involved uh, in yeah. intelligence and 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 gathering stuff. And maybe not quite as much as some people think. But yeah, that is an an asset the allies have. Yes, that's correct. Yep. Right. Back to you. All right. So after San Fratello, they, the division pushes on quickly. Again, trust it. Keep them on the heels. Uh, they press another 10 miles along that coast. They reach uh, Capo do Orlando. Uh, this is, again, an area where uh, the Germans have set up some kind of defense. Uh, the 2nd Battalion, uh, 30th Bernard's Battalion will again uh, since they've already done it, they'll do it a second time. Uh, they're going to go and cut the road uh, beyond the Cape at Brolo. Uh, these landings do commence at three in the morning. Uh, the LST, LCI, and some uh, um, ducks. Uh, they, uh, the entire force does successfully land at four in the morning undetected. Um, uh, they reach the road. They get across the road. They take the hill, the Monte Creole. That'll be the next slide here. And, and then they start wreaking havoc uh, on traffic that's traveling both directions uh, like they're supposed to. Uh, these uh, 105s and these priests uh, placed artillery fire on town. Uh, they had to set up in this um, lemon grove near the, near the coast. Now, the problem was they weren't um, spread out as well as they should have been. They were kind of grouped together. That would be a problem later. Uh, but by 7 in the morning, the Germans uh, wise up to this and they start to respond in force on both sides of them, okay? They're pressed on both sides. <clears throat> and all day long, the second battalion ends up with a, quite a fight on their hands. Um, they gotta get help from the Navy, uh, Naval destroyers. They also get help from Air, Air, um, Air Force. Uh, they have some uh, A6s that come uh, to help bomb uh, German positions. Some of them accidentally bomb um, uh, Bernard CP. Uh, they also, <laughs> they end up knocking out 
hit some of his artillery uh, that were grouped too close together. So air cover, air cover was, or air support was really horrible uh, in the war uh, at this point. Uh, it, it really didn't improve later in, in Italy from what I've come across either. But um, uh, there was a point when the battalion was starting to disorganize and um, Bernard had to pull uh, both E and, uh, I'm sorry, F and G company off the heights and get them down to shore. And they had to kind of group together and circle the wagons for a bit. Um, and uh, he held them together, held out through the afternoon and, and evening. That'll be the next slide here. And then the next morning on the 12th, uh, the 7th uh, Infantry Regiment came through again by way of Nassau. And eight in the morning, uh, they were relieved finally. But it was a little dicey. Uh, this was one. Uh, so if the, the first one was a little too late. This one was a little too early. Uh, but it was effective. It was very effective uh, landing troops behind the Germans. This, this probably gave Allied planners the idea of Anzio. That thought cost my, my head. I just want to make the point about Bernard seems to be also the complete package in terms of, of, of yes. leadership and command. Yeah. You know, I mean, sh should almost be a household name in, in, the, in the, his handling of this. And again, that constant keeping pressure on the enemy. And if, if plan A doesn't work, plan B in, outflank, hit from all sides. It, yeah. it, it's, it, it sounds like it should be textbook stuff, but this is actually... This is something the Allies have still not yet good at. Got good at, you know. We're still right. doing lots of frontal attacks, infantry moving up through open fields under barrages. This yeah. is, this this is how wars should be being fought. Even though they're meeting problems and the Germans are reacting, they seem to be able to pick up their own game and react back to the Germans' reactions and and, and just keep that pressure on. Yes, this no this this was very effective. Both of these were effective. They weren't perfectly executed, but they were very effective ways of breaking those German defenses. And not allowing the Germans to fully set those defenses up, too. So just some more pictures here of Bernard and his uh, battalion. Uh, so let's take a quick look at where we are. This is the 10th of August. So we've been 10 days into this campaign along the coast. Um, uh, Germans and Italian units are now really in full retreat. They're not really able to establish any more defenses at this point. Uh, of course, they have been escaping across the Straits of Messina, uh, this is uh, what Operation Lair Gang, correct? Operation Lair Gang. Uh, they're they are they're slipping away actually, uh, but um, the uh, the one last thing they do for the third division area. Next slide. Uh, one particular area at Cape Calava, there is a big huge rock here that uh, Highway 113 cuts through. There's a tunnel. And it's uh, and it's a, the road is right along the coast, uh, you know, up on uh, cliffs, basically. Uh, the Germans blew out a big section of this road. Uh, only infantry could maybe pass on foot, but you couldn't get any vehicles through. Uh, and there was really no other way to pass. You could not go around it. So um, next slide. You've got these vehicles backed up waiting to, you know, something's got to be done well. You got to call the engineers forward to do something about this. All the only thing you do is you got to rebuild the road. So here they go on to work in that hot sun, rebuilding this road and having not slept for, you know, weeks here. Um, Truscott, uh, being the hands on guy, being the way he is, he stayed with them through the night and he told one of his engineer officers, I'm going to stay here. And I'm going to look impatient until they get the job done. And he did. He stayed with them all night. And there's a story of an engineer. He's working with an air hose, you know, in the night. And he's probably hasn't slept in days, right? He trips over the general's foot, probably not realizing who he is. And he says, hey, why don't you get the hell out of here if you're not working? <laughs> <laughs> and Truscott, you know, again, just credit, you know, he's a, a fighting general. He, he's, yeah, I'm in the guy's way. So he steps out of the way. He doesn't say anything. But he wow. stayed there just watching them. Uh, they did complete that bridge in only 18 hours. That was an astounding feat, really. When you look at some of these photos that are coming up, what they had to do, they had to cut into this rock. They had to drill into this rock. They had to blow holes in the rock to set these uh, pillars. Uh, and uh, they did this all in 18 hours. You can see the plank work that's being done in the next frame. And in the next frame, you can see the very. I mean that next that next photo. That's that's an incredible photo, isn't it? And you know, and yes. we could go down a massive great rabbit hole. And folks, you're now to have a drink because I said rabbit hole several times now. Is that 
I think generally in the Italian campaign, the role of the engineers, British, American, again, is is not talked about enough. I mean, no. we did a show uh, a year and a half ago with Julian Whippy about, I think, one of the British Bailey Bridge units built like an average of more than one Bailey Bridge every day or something in the Italian campaign. It was like 375 bridges yeah. they built, you know, and, and that's just one aspect of it. But clearing passage and, of course, the bringing up of ammunition supplies, the mules, the transport, the Royal Army Service Corps and the British Army, the, the, the quartermasters, the, the supply... Yeah. Yeah. We, we talk a lot about, as we always do, infantry tanks, air power, but it, it, Italy and, and Sicily before it was a real um, low level logistics battle, wasn't it? It was getting stuff to the battlefield, digging through, fording streams and all as it gets to Italy in shitty weather. This is this is baking heat. And then six months mm -hmm. later, they're dealing with freezing gold and mud. Um, yeah. Engineers don't get enough credit in my book. Um, if you're an ex-engineer ex or serving engineer watching this, my hat off to you, sir, exactly. or, or, ma or mom these days. Exactly, and then plus they had to de they had to do all this demining. Yeah, the, the, the declaring. That's yeah. terrible. But it, but yeah, I wanted to mention the as you talked about the quartermasters. Yeah, the, there there was no supplies really coming into Palermo at this point. Maybe starting to, but the supply lines was like 170 miles, 175 yeah. miles back to the beaches where they landed. Uh, so it was a 24 hour tr a truck trip to get to get supplies up to these guys so yeah that's a logistics right a logistics that you, you can talk strategy all day but it's logistics that, that yeah. dictate it's always logistics yeah, yeah. and yeah because just go back through those photos again you look you go from that 18 hours later to a to a, a usable bridge and a road i mean that's insanely good i mean yes and the yeah. first the first vehicle to cross that bridge was general truscott's vehicle to showing the confidence there you he had Exactly. Like like a like a real general, the complete package he was showing the confidence he had in the men that they could do the job. Uh, yeah. High credit to him. So we'll take a, a quick look here. This this comes from the 30th uh, uh, Regiment's history. Uh, this shows this shows the landings. Uh, it uh, just in retrospect at uh, St. Agata and at Brolo, the amphibious landings, the 2nd Battalion, 30th. Uh, 30th went on. They went all the way up to the tip there. Uh, the seventh would end up cutting over to Messina. Uh, that'll be the next slide. We're, we're kind of close to wrapping it up here. So the seventh uh, would end up cutting across uh, over to Messina. They would be one of the, they would be the first allied unit into Messina itself uh, at eight in the morning on the 17th of August. I mean, literally minutes after uh, the Germans had, the last of the Germans and it Italians associates had vacated. There was little to no opposition. Uh, they they ended up um, uh, beating the the British there. Um, uh, this is a, a, a just a picture of town. You can see how narrow the straits are. It's only yeah. two miles over to the coast of Italy, the the, the boot of Italy. Um, Messina Falls. Uh, next slide. That would be just only 38 days after the initial landings. So both uh, Palermo and Messina are now taken. Um, Truscott, uh, you asked about his relationship with Patton earlier. He would not accept the formal surrender. Uh, he waited until Patton arrived two hours later so that Patton would have the honor of, of doing that. I, I like this photo here. I know it's not the best of photos, but uh, you've got a second battalion driver. Uh, he's got a souvenir. Americans uh, love souvenirs, as you know, from the war. Uh, so we've got a Messina sign. I'd love to know where that ended up. I'd imagine it maybe it's it's maybe down in Fort Benning or something. But mm. we've got a, sou a souvenir there. Um, I love this photo too. This is a famous photo. You've probably run across very this famous bridge. cover of a couple of books. That one, yep. yeah. Um, Patton is able to enjoy the the victory parade. Uh, the British arrived shortly after. Uh, the famous scene from Patton, the movie Patton, when Montgomery arrives. You know that sort of thing. Uh, but um, uh, Patton, I think, rightly or wrongly, him doing that, I think he he wanted to show that the Americans were the equals to the British. Um, uh, it was quite embarrassing, our showing in, in North Africa, and uh, Patton wanted to make that a memory, okay? I don't, I don't, I think that really, that's really all it was. Um, this, this photo here is of uh, Lieutenant Colonel Bernard. That is him there on the right with Patton. It wasn't taken at Messina, and well, the sign is there. Uh, this was taken as they were planning the Brolo landing. So Patton was involved with that. He loved the idea. Uh, just, a, just a quick bio on, on uh, 
Bernard. Um, he was born in, in 1910, so he's about 34 years old, uh, class of 1933 West Pointer. Uh, he did receive the Silver Star and the Legion of Merit for his actions in Sicily. Uh, interesting thing about him, um, he, was a, he was a math whiz. He loved mathematics. Uh, so after the war, he went on and taught mathematics post-war. I think that was at West Point, if I remember. He retired in 1963 as a colonel, full colonel, uh, and he died in 1990. So just a quick, just a quick look at the man who, who ended up sort of being going off into anonymity after that. You know, one of these guys goes and he gets his moment, I guess, on the stage and really shines, and then off he goes back to some normal life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. And um, yeah, and, I, and before I, um, when I first saw that photo, I never had no idea who the who he was, and now I've got much thanks to you and. The other yeah. prep I did for this series, that much more better understanding of what a what a guy he was. You know? And yeah. it's been a recurring theme that uh, is that so much of the conversations about Sicily are Patton and Montgomery. They are the slapping of the soldiers come up in the sidebar. Are we, you know, am I going to address that this week? I will do it at some point. I'll bring Kevin Hemel on and we'll talk about that. But as we're finding out, there's so much more of interest to the Husky campaign than just the egos of Patton and Montgomery. That's part of it. Of course, it's part of it. But there's a lot more that's 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 perhaps more worthy of our of our investigation than just that story. Half of which, as people are saying in the sidebar, is affected by the movie portrayal where they make things up and add scenes and have whole interactions that didn't happen. So, yeah, there you are, folks. More to Husky than just Patton and Montgomery. Yeah, I, one thing to say about Bernard, um, uh, yeah, he's an outstanding individual, but there were so many um, young American battalion commanders just like him. Uh, West Point... West Point turned out some fantastic battalion commanders uh, prior to that war. They came out of the th class in the 30s classes. Uh, and uh, uh, there's just a number of them like that in the Italian campaign and into southern France. There's just, just, there's just a number that I've come across. They were just so well equipped to handle um, to handle the, the you know, the, the pressures of that. You being a 29 year old, a 30 something year old, young. Uh, I'm astounded at that. Uh, so American, these young American battalion commanders like Bernard uh, really deserve a lot of credit too. And it, it came up in the show with Mark Zelke about the Canadians is that although there's a divisional commander there, in this case, Simmons, it was actually brigadiers and, and company commanders and battalion commanders who are making the difference there because in the confines of where the, the, the Canadians are fighting, you can't use entire regiments. You have to use companies and, and even platoons. And that's where you're, your, le le your leadership at the captain, yeah. major, yeah. and down to lieutenant or lieutenant level becomes really important. And yet we as a society of military historians, we have this obsession with the the top guys. We have the obsession with the generals. The, you know, the, the, It always comes down to MacArthur in the Pacific and Mark Clark and and, 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 and Arnhem. We talk about Urquhart. We talk about Browning. And yet there's these people at a slightly lower level that are doing the actual fighting. They're the ones actually in many ways making the the, the minute to minute decisions about left or right at this particular point there and yet we seem to ignore those so often we and yet we go right down and then we talk about the kind of the medal of honor people like Audie murphy we talk about so we do the two ends that we we do the generals and those incredibly brave soldiers who receive gallantry medals and yet often the people that actually are making the decisions are seem to be overlooked is that is that fair that's right and i um i <laughs> I, I'm gonna I'm gonna come in and plug my book a bit. Is this, uh, yeah, well, well, but yeah, folks. We'll, the we'll, second, we'll, we'll, yeah, the we'll, second book, right. I, Men of Armor, I wrote, goes into the Italian campaign and specifically the Battle of Monte Cassino, and uh, you will meet some of these uh, b brilliant battalion commanders, these very gifted battalion commanders, uh, fearless battalion commanders, capable. Uh, Russ Clo is one. Major Russ Clo is one guy that comes to mind that was a command of these. Uh, Japanese Americans, the Nisei Battalion, uh, which I got a real soft spot in my heart for these guys because I, you know, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but these, you know, Italian, Japanese Americans, okay, I'm sorry, these Japanese Americans who, uh, you know, back home, their their parents and grandparents are in, they're in camps, right? They were not to be trusted. Here they are fighting for the country patriotic Americans, and they they have their own battalion. Russ Clough was put in charge of these guys, and it, it, he's just, he's an fascinating guy, an amazing guy. These guys are amazing. But, um, yeah, I get down to that level with them because I find that is the most interesting part of the war. Yeah, These guys were faced with these life and death decisions. They did not have the best of intelligence a lot of times. 
They had to shift on the fly. Uh, they only had so much at their disposal at a particular time. They could draw on artillery or maybe they didn't have tanks at all. And, you know, they could draw on the, the 4.2 chemical mortars with the, you know, the razor sharp stuff. Uh, but they had they had to be uh, they had to I hate to word they they, they did to be artists. <laughs> yeah, they had yeah, to yeah. be artists. And if you're a battalion commander, you also you know the people who you're sending their debts. If you're if you're further up, if you're a corps commander or an army commander, yeah, yeah it's numbers. You know, see people like Bradley later on or Mark Clark, they're getting these numbers coming across their desks of one thousand to five hundred cadres a day, but they don't know those people. They don't. It, it must still be shocking and, and sometimes horrific. But yeah. if you're a battalion commander, you you know the names that are coming across your desk. You know you're going to know a lot of the non-coms, the people there. And if you go down to company commanders, they don't only know them; they're they're almost friends. I mean, okay, there's that command yeah. difference between a, a commander, and so that that to me gives them even more respect. They're having to make decisions, but they actually know by name. They probably know. Whether they're married, some of the guys, you know, the kind of company yeah. commanders, the platoon commanders, saying, you know, that that guy's got a wife background. That guy, you know, he only celebrated his wedding anniversary last week, and yet I've got to send him across that field to attack that thing. So I, I think battalion commanders and people like that, are, 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 that they have all, all the difficulties and none of the praise. Yeah, there was a there was a particular lieutenant colonel, a battalion commander, um, a casino. His name was Mosley. And the orders that were getting came down from the regiment. Well, you, you know, as they're coming down from from the Fifth Army down through the corps, down to fall on his shoulders, and he says, "I'm not going to order my guys to do this if I'm not going to do it myself." And he 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 went right up onto the line with them, and he's one of the first to get shot right through the head. Yeah, he wasn't going to order them to do something that he wasn't willing to do himself, and he was one of the first casualties to go. Yeah, yeah I know. Well. Yeah, this you're absolutely right about. We're going that. we're going down a rabbit hole, but it's an important one. But yeah. we will move back to Messina and 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 the, the ensuing summary of this this fantastic yeah. show. Yeah, we'll, we're we're wrapping it up. Um, so so unfortunately, you know, we know the Germans and the and Italian their allies they were able to escape. Um, the the 15th and the 29th German Panzer Grenadier divisions, the Gehring, Hermann Gehring division, the first parachute, they were able mostly to escape. Uh, 40,000 German troops got across, 10,000 vehicles. They got artillery. They got tanks that are going to fight another day. There's also six, uh, well, 100,000 total, 60,000 Italians that join them. Uh, this was a bit of an embarrassment, really, when you look back on it. Um, the Allies didn't seem to be prepared for that possibility. It's like they didn't think this could happen. And uh, and there really wasn't any plans to bomb Messina or, you know, uh, you know, on the other hand, Messina was well protected, but it just doesn't seem like, you know, maybe you've got to talk to some of this people who've gotten into the Allied strategy. It doesn't seem like they were ready for this. It doesn't seem like well, they I mean, were... James Horn made the point that, I mean, I forget the exact figure, but there was like 350 German anti-aircraft guns and guns on the other side of the Messina. And that hitting the kind of vessels the Germans are using to escape their men, which are barges barely, you know, feet long rather than yards long. They're not easy to hit with strategic bombing. They're not easy to hit. Okay. So, so if the his point was, if the Germans had been trying to evacuate in, you know, massive great troop ships, it might have been easier. And he also okay. made the point that most yeah. evacuations in the war, whether it's the Allies doing on the Axis, more of them are successful than not. They are, that you know, Dunkirk being a famous one for the Brits. So, so he's quite, um, yeah, and he's just one historian. There's other views as well, but he is quite, you know. To be honest, it was a tough. It would have been a tough thing yeah. for the Allies to have achieved. You know, the fact that Germans got got there so many away is not really an Allied mistake. Is his point of view? Others watching this may disagree. Well, I'm glad, and I'm glad that that, that perspective is out there because, uh, yeah, it, people can look back at this and say, well, you know, they let all these guys escape. They will fight another day. Yeah, that is that is a bit of embarrassment. But it's important to go to what the objectives were, the main objectives. That would be the next slide. And th those objectives were met. Uh, well, those are prisoners. We will we'll move on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there we are. Retrospective. Yeah, yeah. so the, 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 the main objectives were, uh, the, you know, to, to get Sicily to, to um, secure the shipping, which they did. After that, uh, uh, German attacks on uh, North Africa, Africa fell off quite dramatically. They still were doing it, but they weren't effective at all. It did knock Italy out of war. That's important to know. Uh, right after um, the third division took uh, Palermo, uh, Mussolini was deposed. He was he was uh, 
voted out of his fascist council or whatever. Uh, Italy was already starting to negotiate to get out of the war. They did get out of the war immediately after Sicily fell. It was the 8th of September when they formally said we're done. Uh, so Churchill was absolutely right. Uh, this was also this also affected uh, the disposition of German troops. They now had to uh, 85 Italian divisions they had to replace. Now, these weren't the best equipped troops. They didn't match up to a German division. But now these German divisions had to be pulled from combat duty and, and they had to do, uh, you know, occupational duty and this sort of thing. And Hitler did have to call off a major operation, Operation Zitadel, uh, once the landings were established uh, in Kursk. Uh, and after this, uh, the Germans were on the defense for the rest of the war. So, uh, you know, I won't like to say Sicily is the reason why Germany wanted it, but this was the like the last kick in that door before it came down, correct? Wouldn't yeah. you say? Yeah, no, I'd agree. I'd, I'd, I'd so, agree. Yeah. Germany was not able to mount any kind of uh, major offense after this. They were, it's all purely defense from then on. Uh, exactly. So we'll take a quick look at, we're back, we're talk, supposed to talk third division. So we'll get back to them. Um, they, the casualties were, uh, you know, moderate. Um, they, they lost about 400 men killed, uh, another, uh, 1400 wounded, uh, 146 missing. So it's about 2000, uh, total battle, battle casualties. Uh, they had about another 3000 that were non-battle casualties. These would probably be from the heat, uh, maybe drinking bad water. Uh, malaria was still a problem, you know, so, um, this, this was the cost the third division paid. Now, a number of these guys would eventually come back, but we did have, uh, next slide, uh, two Medal of Honor recipients from third division. One was Lieutenant Robert Craig. He was killed in action that was outside of Campobello the, after the first day. Um, he was, uh, he died protecting uh, his platoon. He, he basically protected his platoon, let his platoon withdraw. He took, he took the bullets for him. Um, Lieutenant David uh, Willett Weber, he was in third recon. It was their night. Uh, they ran across uh, four Italian tanks that, that gave them trouble, uh, going to threaten to destroy them. And he ended up battling them with a Tommy gun and knocked, killed a driver with one and warded him off. He was seriously wounded. So two Medal of Honors. Next slide, we have um, 10 Distinguished Service Crosses also awarded. This is one step below Medal of Honor plus a bunch of silver stars, a whole boatload of bronze stars. Um, next, I'll move Just to, to, to go back, because we've got a question for, about the cadre. That that list of casualties there, that's from a, how how big was the 3rd Division going into? Because, you know, you, you, broke, you broke down the units attached to it. How? how, how, well, that, how the 3rd Division itself had about 14,000 men. Yeah, that's what we thought. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yep. So we're not including anybody from the divisions that were they were reinforced with. All right, so they, so after uh, Messina, uh, they moved all the way west to Trapani. They reorganized, they rest for a few days, a couple a couple weeks. And, um, you know, they take on USO shows, that sort of thing. We've got, next slide there, we've got Bob Hope who made the rounds. Everybody saw Bob Hope at some point. It was, it was in the- Whether uh, they wanted to or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably several times, right? But what else are you going to do, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, in this next slide, you can see them sort of resting, relaxing. It wasn't very long for them. Um, uh, on the 9th of September, uh, the 5th Army landed at Salerno. As you know, the 8th Army had already crossed at Messina. They were in the tip of the boot. They were moving up up the, up the boot. The 5th the Army landed in sort of that amphibious end around. It did not go well the first week. Uh, it was rough. Uh, so the 3rd Division was called in to help shore things up on the 17th. So Third Division's rest did not last very long, and not suddenly there the Italian campaign. And um, uh, we can uh, we can learn a few lessons from this. Um, the Sicilian campaign, um, uh, the British and American, Canadians, uh, the French, uh, all learned that they could uh, work together. They could achieve compl uh, complicated objectives together. Uh, that was good uh, going forward. Uh, American forces also gained some practical experience. This was very good for them, especially their confidence. Um, there was much better amphibious uh, Army-Navy co cooperation, much better operations. You could see how much more advanced they were from Torch. Um, the Sicilian terrain also, I think this is quite important. It prepared them for Italy. 
Uh, Italy is going to be very, very much the same. The German tax is going to be very much the same. Uh, of course, the weather is going to get worse. It's going to be snow and rain. But uh, this prepared them for the Italian campaign. And with that, yeah, we, we, and we talked we talked about it before going live. Is that the, the the other interesting thing is that you can absolutely see that the improvements from Torch to Husky, and yet between Husky and then Salerno and and Overlord in Normandy. The, the, the allies shuffle their pack. Leaders move from one theater to another theater. Commanders come and go. And, and despite the fact they've made these lessons, there is definitely a sense of two steps forward, one step back. You know, there, there are improvements for Overlord and there are improvements for Salerno and things are learned for Anzio. But you kind of feel that, that the shuffling means they lose, a, they, lack a, they lose a bit of momentum. You know, because, you know, Montgomery was with 8th Army and goes off for 21st Army Group. Simmons, the Canadian, goes off to, to the 2nd Corps and not be, and you feel that maybe uh, if they had maybe kept a bit more continuity of leadership and things and units going into Italy, maybe, uh, and then and then do bring, I don't know. It's it's interesting that you can definitely see if you could if you were to you know, draw a graph of, of allied improvements and amphibious operations, there's a, I would say, Husky reaches a peak and then it kind of drops again and, and then they have to relearn some of the same lessons for Normandy. Would you, I know you're primarily a, you know, uh, an Italy and South of France guy. But would you agree that some of the lessons have to kind of be relearned later? Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact, too, that you're bringing in all these green troops, too, that don't That's true. That hadn't, hadn't really gone through it. I know now the 45th, uh, when they landed here in Sicily, they were green. They were coming over. The first the first division and the third division were experienced. They had landed in Torch. 45th was brand new, so now they're getting the experience. When they go into Italy, then they're going to be bringing the 34th in. Oh, well, they, well, they had been in, oh, but they're going to be bringing the 88th. They're going to be bringing the 85th into Italy. They'll be they'll be breaking out at, at Operation Datum later. So they they were constantly bringing in these green troops too. So it's kind of watering down that experience. So that might account for that two steps forward, mm. one step back thing too, because you're bringing in green troops and they hadn't actually been through it, uh, although maybe the other unit over had, right? So yeah. uh, So when they landed, but when they landed in um, in uh, south of France uh, in August, um, those, all three of those units that landed, American units were were very experienced. They took the, the most experience, the third, the 45th and 36th for that operation. So that went very well. So you, you, there, there, it could be that the fact that there were green troops involved maybe that I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's lots of stuff to discuss. We will do a week uh, a week or two later in the year about, about Salerno and the, and the ensuing fight in Italy. And we'll do something about Dragoon at some point, probably next year uh, for the 80th. Yeah. But yeah, and and we'll move on to the, to the to the end of this. Then we'll talk about your books again. So um, people are saying in the sidebar how much they've loved this. You're all saying how great this has been. Jeff has been. So you know what to do, folks. Uh, if you want to reward Jeff, you can go out there and, and purchase uh, one or other of these books. Uh, you can get there. Jeff has his own website. You can find it at the bookshop of your choice. You know, and you've learned today, if you didn't watch the previous show with Jeff, is Jeff knows his subject. And remember, his specialist uh, role is the, is the Army. It's the the you know, third division is his, is the, is the sec your second game, in a sense. You know, so, uh, yeah. But, yeah, an exemplary pr presentation. Um, and um, your last show there is your, you know, your, 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 one of your honours. And, you know, you're heavily involved with the veterans associations. So just, just run down what, what you've been doing in addition to writing books and how, how you're involved in history in, in your various, various forms. Well, um, I, I, uh, I think it's okay to say this. I, I actually was invited uh, back in – in March, I, I gave a talk, a remote talk to the current uh, battalion commanders in the active third division. Uh, the commanding general got a hold of my book and enjoyed it and wanted me to talk to staff. I was a little nervous about that. Um, I'm like, what is a guy talking about 80 year old uh, army have to offer to guys today? So I ended up talking about how how they develop leadership, uh, because I think those lessons are always the same uh, in the battalion throughout the war. So. Uh, I did that. Um, I have done talks with you. Um, I, I'm still involved in the third division. I, I sit on this uh, scholarship board with them. Um, I haven't been to a reunion in a while. I know most of these World War II guys are now gone. It's very sad. Yeah, um, I, I was very active in going to those uh, back uh, 15, 20 years ago when a lot of them were still alive. And it was wonderful. I tell you, they are the most wonderful group of guys I know you've had the the honor uh, of, of walking with them in yeah. the battlefield. Yeah. I did too. 
in southern France. I, I was able uh, to do the same. So um, these, uh, you know, uh, um, I uh, I was involved when the 756 had their organization. I ended up, um, as they got older, I ended up being the secretary. I set up a website for them. I maintain that website, continue, even though they're gone. Um, uh, so, yeah, I kind of, I'm the guy uh, still uh, turning the lights out, I guess, at the end uh, of the whole thing, but I'm still maintaining their their memory. And that's something we've, we're well done for doing that. That's something that, you know, having chats with various historian friends is that we are in the era, we're going to be hitting that era very, very soon now where there are no living uh, 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 survivors of World War II, even children who live through it. We're closing, you know, that door is about to be closed now. Yeah. And they're, therefore, you know, not not blowing my own trumpet about, about YouTube, but books are one way of finding out about history. But the, the next generation won't necessarily be able to meet a World War II veteran. They won't be able to. They'll have to use whatever resources. So so although some historians are very dismissive of things like video games and TikTok and Instagram and YouTube, but that will be the way forward for people to get information. Books are very important to me, but for generations mm -hmm. moving forward, they may not be. So it's important that websites are maintained and people still talk about this uh, and younger people still talk about this because you know, the fact is that, you know, that our military are still serving around the war. There are people dying in combat right now in different parts of the world. And there are still lessons that you can take from Colonel Bernard and others that are just as applicable today about getting the job done, leading from the front that, you know, OK, the weapons have changed, technology has changed, but the basic principles are still pretty much the same, aren't they? Yes. But one thing I can take away, you know, hopefully none of us, well, there are, there are people out there that are involved in wars, but hopefully you and I, won't be involved in wars or our children. Let's if they need me now, it's because they've got really desperate. 54 years old with a bit of a spare <laughs> tire around the middle. If they need me, I think it's because they're getting yeah, well, they're just... the of the barrel, broken through the battle, and they're in things the are... below the barrel, I think. Things are really bad at that point if you and I are, are called up. But but, uh, but what I'm, I'm saying, the most important thing, the lesson I take from this is, is uh, these guys went through some of the, the, the toughest stuff you can imagine. And if you've got a problem in your life, it ain't nothing compared to what these guys can do. And if they could get through what they could get, get through, you can get through what you're facing today. So whatever that is, you can take that confidence. You can take that confidence they had, you know, and you can apply it in your life no matter what it is, you know, uh, yeah, losing a job or whatever it is. You can, you can get through whatever your adversity is because these guys could get through the adversity they went through. I take that away. I care with that with me every day. No, that's a very good point to end on. So it's been absolutely spellbinding listening to you, Jeff. I can't wait to bring you, bring you back and we'll do Italy at some point in the future. Folks, that's don't forget Steve Clay is with us tomorrow to talk about the first division. I have still have provisionally the show with Melissa Wing for Saturday, but I've got to confirm with Melissa, well, it will be happening on Saturday, but the show with Alex Black talking about air power will definitely be happening this weekend, but I will confirm whether or not the show with Melissa is happening or not. And then Monday, we've got the show about the cop parties. So some of you asked earlier on about surveying of the beaches done in advance. That will be talked about on Monday with the two guys from the Malta Command Living History Group. And then there's shows next week about Normandy. Peter Hart is coming on. Uh, we've got some great stuff coming our way. Then um, we've got the Philippines week. Oh, the progression will be made on the Philippines. But I'm so looking forward to that. Some amazing historians are going to be talking about aspects of the Philippines fighting. Uh, I can't wait. But, Jeff, thank you very much for, for coming on again. Your presentation has been superb. Folks, you know what to do. Go and buy the books. Check out Jeff's website. And um, I will see everybody again tomorrow for Steve Clay. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for watching. Bye.